probably should turn this on. But let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, uh, for allowing us to be together on this wonderful Sabbath day, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for your law, your standard of righteousness. Your word tells us in Psalm 89, 14, that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. And so, Lord God, we praise you and we thank you. Now, we know, Lord, that it is not in our own strength that we could live a righteous life and to keep thy commandments, but it is by Christ and in Christ who has kept all the laws and who has lived perfectly and through Christ we too can have victory over sin. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, 1962, it was a movie. Movie directed by Orson Welles. Orson Welles. Anybody know Orson Welles? What's that? 1984. Oh, okay. Well, this movie was called The Trial. It was an interesting movie. It's called The Trial. And um, Orson Welles said it was the best film he ever made. And it was based on the story called The Trial by the Jewish writer Franz Kafka. Anybody ever hear Franz Kafka? He uh, wrote surreal kinds of stories. And so this was a movie like that. Very interesting movie. Now, in the movie, the main character was called Joseph K. And Joseph K was guilty of a crime. And he didn't know what the crime was. And he couldn't do anything about it. And so the whole movie was dealing with this sense of guilt. He had a problem. There was corruption in the system, and he was a victim of the system. And so he was kind of like trapped in this bureaucracy and could never, uh, never um, vindicate himself. And in the end of the movie, he ends up getting executed with dynamite. <laughs> Pretty bleak story. Well, in the beginning of the movie now, there was a parable. And it was very interesting how it was presented. It was a parable about the door of the law. And in that parable, a man comes to the door of the law. And he wants to enter the door of the law. And there's a guard there who says, you can't enter without my permission. And then the man peeks through. He he's, understands that the door of the law, the law should be accessible to all people. All people. And... The guard says, don't try to get past me. I'm very powerful. And after me, there are other halls with other doors and other guards and one more powerful than the next. So the man has no chance to get into the door of the law. So he ends up sitting there at the entrance. He stays there. And over his entire lifetime, he gives all that he has to the guard with hopes that maybe he could bribe the guard and enter the door of the law. And as he gets older, he even starts talking to the fleas in the guard's collar and tells them to tell the guard to change his mind. But the guard won't change his mind. And in the very end of the sad parable, when he's an old man sitting there, he asks a question uh, that he's never asked in his whole life. He says, I had understood that the door was accessible to all people. How come in my entire life I've never seen anybody else come here? And then the guard said to him, he had to yell because he was hard of hearing at that age, and he said to him, this door was only meant for you. Nobody else could have ever entered into it, only you. And now it is closed forever. What a bleak story. And I was thinking about that, and people have wondered about the meaning of this parable and how does it relate to the movie how does it relate well you know one one thing I was thinking about as I was pondering this what it seems to represent to me is a world without grace a world without grace we cannot by the law have salvation the man was trying to to work his way you know bribe the guard 
And maybe the guard represented the law. Maybe the guard represented one of the precepts of the law. Maybe a, a lesser precept that in our own strength we can't even keep. And then he mentioned the other guards were even more and more powerful. And so there was no way to satisfy the law. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? All have sinned, Romans 3, 23, and fallen short of the what? The glory of God. Born with a sinful nature, right? Conceived in sin. We've all fallen short. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the free gift of God, however, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If it wasn't for the mercy, Jesus says, I am the way, right? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus kept the law perfectly because of his victory. And through Christ, we can be in Christ, the Bible says. In Christ, I am a new creature. I am a new creation. So in a sense, as I was thinking about that parable in that movie, that bleak parable about trying to enter the law, well, none of us can obtain perfection in terms of in our own strength, to be perfectly right and righteous as far as the law is concerned because we have a sinful nature. In the movie, there is a scene there where the main character, Joseph K., uh, was played by Tony, Tony Perkins, by the way. And some no, might know he played in a psycho movie. Not, not that I'm recommending to see any of those movies, but he was very... Uh, he, at one point, he said, um, who isn't guilty? Something to that effect. Who isn't guilty? If your thought strays in the wrong direction, if you, if you think the wrong thing, if you look in the wrong way, you're guilty. You've already... And let's turn in our Bible and see. In the book of Matthew, chapter... Let's take a look in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and we could see something that relates to what the, to what the, the Joseph K. character said. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew, chapter 5. And let's look at verse 21, and let's look at verse 22. And then we'll look at verse 27 and 28. Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to start reading here. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, in starting verse 21, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But then in verse 22 it says, But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So now we're getting into the, the motives of the heart the motives of the heart. And a person can be in sin internally. How can we keep the commandments of God in our own strength? We're always thinking, and the Bible tells us every inclination of the thoughts of men's heart, evil continually. The book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Every inclination of the thoughts of men's heart, evil continually. Genesis 6 and verse 5. Well, when we turn and continue to read in Matthew, chapter 5 and 27, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So now we're seeing that the law of God gets not only to the outward, but to what's going on inwardly in a person. And so it relates to what was going on, what I mentioned, the Joseph K. character, questioning who isn't guilty, who is not. And in the movie, he was, like I said, trapped in this bureaucracy that was full of corruption. So nobody was keeping the law, ultimately, but he was the one that was guilty. He was the one that was guilty. Well, self-righteousness is a dangerous thing. We can only have righteousness through Christ. Praise the Lord. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah, 
Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Okay. And it says in verse number seven, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You see, the Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah 17, 9, the human heart is deceitful. Above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? When, when Eve sinned in the beginning, it started with the thoughts. And so Jesus is getting into the thoughts. And here it says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We need the mercy of God. Amen. The character in the parable needed the mercy. He needed mercy, but there was no mercy. See, if you don't have Christ, the law reveals to us that we are guilty by the law. And that's what Paul says. Paul speaks about that in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 2. And starting in verse number 15, he says, We who are Jews by nature, but not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Even we ourselves have believed in Christ, that we may be justified by Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And that's what he's saying there, basically. I'm paraphrasing, but that's Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. And then in verse 19, he says, For I through the law died to the law that I might live for God. For I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. But it is not I that liveth, right? The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. And then in verse number 21, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, he says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness was through the law, Christ died in vain. You see? But he then explains, and you've got to put all his writings together, he's not saying to live a lawless life. Because he says, sin shall no longer have dominion over you because you are not under the law but under grace. And Romans Chapter 6 and verse 14. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Why? You are not under the law, but under grace. But sin will not have dominion over you. And so in Romans 8, which I call the celebration chapter in verse 4, he makes it clear there that the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the law reveals that we are sinners. The law reveals that we need a Savior. If we truly understand the law of God, it's not just about outward actions. You see, that was the mistake that the Pharisees made. They were focusing in the outward. But when Jesus in Matthew 23 pointed out, hypocrites, hypocrites, you look good on the outside, but what was going on on the inside? Sin starts first in the heart, in the mind. You see, that's where it starts. And so we don't have to live a life of guilt but we could surrender our lives to Christ. And so that movie, The Trial, I think is an interesting, um, it, there is the, the focus of guilt in the movie, the guilt in the main character, um, sin, wickedness, and no atonement for it because there's no Christ in this, in this worldview presented in that movie. People need the Lord. People need Christ. He, he is the answer that people need. You see, the problem by nature is we want to solve our problems. Our, uh, we have that natural problem where we want to make ourselves right with God. And sometimes people say religion is a crutch. It's for weak people. But the truth is we're all weak. We all have the weakness of sin. And we all need a Savior. Praise the Lord that there is a Savior. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, let's turn to Hebrews, Hebrews, 
And let's turn to chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4. And let's look at verse number 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter 4, 14 to 16. And here we see, seeing then, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. So Jesus is the great high priest. And so there is a, a heavenly sanctuary. We read a little bit more about that in chapter 8. And then it says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. And Jesus makes clear that sin starts in the mind. So he never even thought a sinful thought. He never had a sinful inclination. See, by nature we're inclined toward wickedness. We have sinful propensities. That's why Paul says, um, in me there is nothing good. That, that is in my flesh. For to will is present. I may want to do what is good, but how to do what is good I cannot find. We have that inclination. Sometimes when you're praying, these wicked thoughts come into your mind so that you can't even enjoy your prayers to the Lord. Doesn't that ever happen to you? We become sensitive because they're always there. They're always there. We just become more sensitive when we pray because we, we care about having pure thoughts then. But throughout the day, these wicked thoughts and all these things are going through our mind because we have this sinful nature. But the Bible says, as we looked in the book of Isaiah 55 and verse 7, let the unrighteous forsake his thoughts, right? Let him forsake his thoughts. So our thoughts can be transformed, but it's a lifetime process. It's the process that we talk about when we talk about sanctification. And sanctification is what? Sanctification is growing in holiness, which is really growing in the character of Christ. Well, let's continue to look here at Hebrews 4. And we were in number uh, 14, and where it says that he was tempted on all points as we are. But then it says, yet without what? Without sin. And then in verse 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So because we have that perfect, perfect advocate, Jesus, our great high priest, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. This, this theme of being in Christ is so essential to the gospel there, there is no gospel if there is no in Christ, the in Christ theme. As I said, going back to the book of Romans, we can see there in verse uh, chapter 8, which I call the celebration chapter, it starts out with the words in Christ, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation. Joseph K. in the trial, he was condemned. He was guilty. Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And the very last verse in the chapter, Romans chapter 8, tells us once again, Romans chapter 8, verse 39, tells us, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. In Christ, you are a new creature. In Christ, you are a new creation. In Christ, you have victory. In Christ, you have hope. In Christ, you have salvation. In Christ, you have a new heaven and a new earth to look forward to. It's all in Christ. Praise God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him shall never perish, but shall have everlasting life. This world will remember your sins. 
People will remember where you came from. They'll say, you're not in any position to tell me anything. I remember you back then. I know who you are. Then the devil will say the same thing. I know who you are. But what matters is what God knows. Are you in Christ or are you outside of Christ? One way or another, judgment will all happen by Christ. And either we're going to die in Christ, like Paul said, in Christ I am a new creature, new creation. I am crucified with Christ, right? And yet I live, but it is not I, right? So either we're going to die in Christ or we're going to die outside of Christ. But all judgment is through Christ because Christ is the word. Christ is the embodiment of all righteousness, the standards of God, but also the love of God. All the word became flesh, the Bible tells us in the book of John 1, 14. In the beginning was the word. And the word was all of the, the law. When we look at the law, let's turn back to the book of, well, let me take a look at a couple of things before I go. I'm going to go, I'll put a mark over there and put it, you can put your finger over there or hold on to it. Let's just hold on to it. We won't read it yet, but let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 20. We'll, we'll hold on to that. We won't read that yet. Exodus chapter 20, which has the Ten Commandments there. But before we do that, let's go to Romans chapter 7. And in Romans chapter 7, let's go over here at the beginning of the chapter. Romans chapter 7, right in the beginning. I'm going to start from the beginning of the chapter. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now, let's hold on to that a minute. Listen to what's being said here. The law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Okay, we'll hold on to that one minute. Let's go back to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 9 says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. Talking about, are the Jews better than the Gentiles? And he says, not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Greeks, and Greeks is really a way of referring to Gentiles, that they are all under sin. You see? Everyone is under sin. You can't say, well, what about those people who don't know the law? Well, they have a conscience. And that's covered in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15. And the conscience is the window to the Holy Spirit. So everybody has a chance to at least know some of the basics about what is right and wrong. And God judges based on what a person knows. But the Bible tells us here that all are what? Under sin. Under sin. Well, when we go ahead in the same chapter to verse number 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. You see? So to be under sin is to be what? Under the, the law. That was what Joseph K. was in the, in the movie. That was what the man in the parable was who couldn't enter the door of the law. No grace under the law. Well, that's the condition we all are. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it's saying under the law is under sin. And that's what we see the comparison there in Romans 3.19. It says that every mouth, it doesn't say that some mouths, it says that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So the law reveals that we've all fallen short. So going back to Romans chapter 7 now, and it says, right in the beginning, once again, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. As long as he lives. And we continue. For the woman who has a husband, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, as long as the husband lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she is called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Okay, if the husband dies. But then in verse 4 it says, Therefore, my brethren, 
you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. You're not under the law any longer. Dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him, that is to Christ, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. You see? So the, the flesh has to die. What is that talking about? Well, we'll just hold on to there, and it tells us in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 1, 2, and 3, Romans 8, 1, 2, and 3, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his only son, oh, his, his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. What does it mean to walk according to the flesh? To be in the flesh is to walk according to the flesh. And it says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So that is what it is to be in the flesh. To be in the flesh is to be carnally minded rather than spiritually minded. To have your mind on earthly things rather than godly things. Worldly gain rather than heavenly gain. To not have your affection on the things of heaven, but on the things of this earth. On me, 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 my, 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 I want this, I want that. That's to be carnally minded. But it's not about what does God want. To be carnally minded, you don't care what God wants. But when you're in the spirit, you're moved by the spirit of God rather than your own spirit. So when Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, that means the spirit of self, the spirit of pride. The spirit of I, in, as I always say, in the middle of the word sin is the letter I, right? In the middle of the word pride is the letter I. It's a word. I is a word. So that's what it is to be carnally minded. That's what it is to be in the flesh. And we continue to Romans chapter 8. If we look then at verse number uh, thir uh, 12 and 13, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See? That's what it is. So when we go back to Romans chapter 7, and it says in verse number 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also became dead to the law through the body of Christ. Why? Because you've been born again. You're not under the law anymore. You're not under sin anymore. You're not controlled by the lusts of the, of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and by appetites and emotions. That's what it is to be under the law. It's to be under sin. It's to be in the flesh. That means you're controlled. We live in a world where many people, we see examples of it all around us, people controlled by appetites and emotions, right? And people are ready to riot. People are ready to fight. People are ready. Pride, right? You insulted me. You offended me. And you know, pride is a dangerous burden to have. But Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what, Sophie? Rest. <laughs> so here we see that you may be married to another. Grace. You see? To him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Now, this is Romans, going back in Romans 7 and verse 4. Number 5 says, For when we were in the flesh, so Paul is saying, look, we're not in the flesh anymore. We're in the spirit now. He's not talking about killing yourself. And he's, he's, he was physically present there, right? He's not talking about that. He's, he's not, he's not um, forgetting the human experience. But he is identifying himself as no longer being in the flesh. Paul is. And, he, and then he's saying, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused, now look at that, by the law. 
Why would the sinful passions be aroused by the law? Why was it that the Pharisees were the one? They knew the law, didn't they? Why was it that they gave Jesus the hardest time? Because the flesh rebels against the law of God. You see? So if you know more of the law, you know those lawyers, they know the law. They know how to break the law more than anybody else. If you know the law, you know how to break the law. If you're not so, now when you talk about the law of God, if you know the law, but you have, the law should point you to Christ. So those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and lawyers should have been the first ones to come to Christ, but they were the most rebellious against Christ. They were more accountable because they knew the law, you see? And so what he's saying here, and, and this connects with what we see in Romans chapter 8. If we go to Romans chapter 8, here's the answer to why that is. Why is it that somebody who would have more access and knowledge of the law would actually become a greater lawbreaker if they don't surrender to Christ. Well, look at Romans chapter 8, and let's look at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is in enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. You see? It is not subject to the law of God. So all you'll do, if you have more knowledge and awareness of the law of God, if you haven't surrendered to the law of God, all you'll do is find out ways to break the law. More sophisticated ways to break the law. That's what lawyers are good at. Finding loopholes, finding, creating other laws, right? That's what can happen if you're not surrendered to Christ. You see what it says? For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. So the more law without Christ, the more rebellion. The more law without Christ, the more rebellion, because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, and it is not subject to the law of God. Okay, so now, going back to Romans, when it said there in verse number 5 of Romans chapter 7, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Remember what Jesus said, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites. Remember that? Hypocrites. And then he pointed out that they created traditions, and by those traditions, they were actually undermining the law of God. You see? They knew the law, and they knew it so well that they knew how to rely on their own understanding. Sometimes we got to be careful about that because sometimes we do that with God. We read the word, and then we're convicted of our sin, but we don't want to accept it, and then we reason. And that's what they were doing. You see, because if you're not surrendered to Christ, you'll fi figure out ways to twist the law and to twist the scripture in order to support yourself because when you're in the flesh, you're in enmity against God. You're in enmity against the law. Now in verse number 6 of Romans chapter 7, it says, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, in other words, you are under the law when you're under sin. You are a prisoner of the law. Kind of like the man in the parable in the, the movie The Trial in the beginning. He was a prisoner. He couldn't get through the law. He was stuck there. He was a prisoner of the law. But he says, so that we should serve in newness of the spirit and not oldness of the letter. And then in verse 7, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Well, let's read that. Some people misunderstand this. They think, well, maybe that's just talking about the Old Testament ceremonial laws. Well, let's continue. Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said what? You shall not covet. So that's not talking about the ceremonial laws. That's talking about the Ten Commandment laws. You see? Not talk. Some people say, well, that's talking about this. He just said, thou shall not covet. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. And he's saying, I know sin because the law identifies sin. And then he goes on. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment. Why? Because the flesh is an enmity against God. When Paul was a Pharisee, for example, he knew the law. He knew what was written. And he was killing people. Paul was killing people. 
thinking that he was keeping the commandments of God. How could that happen? Because he was still in the flesh. He was breaking the law. He was doing more damage, having Christians killed. And he said, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So if there is no law, there is no sin. But the God's law is eternal. So sin exists. Because even in heaven, before the commandments were written, before Mount Sinai, before the commandments were given to Moses, did Lucifer sin? Yes. So that means the law is eternal. So as long as the law stands, if anybody violates the law, there would be sin because righteousness and justice are the foundation of the throne of God. And so then it says, I was once alive without the law. In other words, he was living lawlessly. <laughs> but then it says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. In other words, when he truly saw the law for what it was, he realized I can't ever be right with the law. And then he says, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. The commandment can't save you. But the commandment points you to someone who can. Praise the Lord. And then he says, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, this is Romans seven eleven. for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Okay, how did sin take occasion by the commandment? How did it deceive him? By it, because the commandment reveals sin. But the commandment doesn't do anything to, to give you victory over sin. So you're in trouble. You realize I'm guilty, I'm dead. And then he goes on, therefore the law is holy, he concludes in verse 12. And the commandment, holy, just, and good. Because it if it's holy, it reveals what is unholy. But then he says in verse 13, and then what is good how then what is good, how then what is good become death to me? I'm sorry, I just read that wrong three different ways. I'll try it again. Has then what is good become death to me? So he's saying, has that, in other words, has the law become death to me? The law is what he's talking about as being good. But he says, certainly not. It's not the law. The law is not death. The law reveals sin, but he says, but sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good. Because the law revealed sin is producing death in you. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So anybody who truly understands the commandment understands their need for the Savior. The commandment reveals that none of us can ever be right with God. But praise the Lord, Christ can make us right with God. Christ can give us victory. Christ can give us a new mind. And Paul says that. He makes that clear, that we could have a new mind, a new character, a new attitude. We could be born again, and we can keep the law, not in our own strength, but Christ in you. Praise the Lord. Isn't that good news? Yes, yes his law is so perfect that none of us can keep it, but Jesus can. You see, the sin... The, the more serious God is, the more serious sin is. You believe that? Because if sin is, if you could keep the commandments and you could get right with God in your own strength, like, like all the other religions of the world teach, they don't teach you need a savior, they don't teach that Christ died for you and you need Christ to have salvation. If you could solve the problem yourself, then sin's not that serious. And if sin isn't that serious, then it means it's not that serious to break God's standards. And if it's not that serious to break God's standards, then God is not that serious. You see, his standards are not that serious. But the more perfect God is, the more perfect his standards are. Isn't that the truth? And the Bible reveals his standards are so perfect, there's no way we can keep them. So he sent his son to die for us. God had to step into the picture to solve the problem because we couldn't solve it ourselves. Like I said, the more serious sin is, the more serious God is. The less serious sin is, the less serious God is. And so the problem of sin is so serious that God had to solve the problem, and he did. God so loved the world that he gave 
His only begotten Son. Nobody has to teach you to sin. Does anybody have to teach you to sin? Children, do you have to teach a child to disobey? No, you have to teach a child to obey. Sin comes naturally. So we all have this sinful nature, but in Christ, we can have a new nature. We could be born again. We could live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Praise the Lord. Good news. Amen. Amen. Well, that's the message that the world needs to hear. Because with Christ, there's hope. There's no hope in the things of this world. And we could look forward to something better than what this world offers us. Well, let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we close this message about the law, the door of the law, the door of the law, Heavenly Father, we realize that the only one who could make us right, who could make us righteous, is Christ, our righteousness. Your word reveals that he is our righteousness, that no flesh will glory in your presence, for of him and through him and to him we can have newness of life. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Your word tells us this, and we praise you for your word. We praise you that your word became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you for the hope, for the transformation of mind and character in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.